This is Karen, a normal and charming mother of four in Manila, Philippines. Karen likes doing perfectly normal things, like taking her children to the pool on the weekend. This is also a normal situation for Karen and millions of people like her. She's putting her children to bed on the last evening of her vacation before she flies back to work in Dubai. When I spent time with Karen, this was her fourth time on vacation at home in seven years. The last time she was home was to give birth to the little boy in her lap. Now, why would anyone live like that? Well, this is actually the new normal for the world's economic migrants, the remittance workers, the ones who go voluntarily away to faraway lands in order to earn money and send money home to their families and villages in hope of, you know, of uh, creating a better future for their children and loved ones. There are about 250 million migrants in the world. And it's an inexact science how many of these are remittance workers, maybe half, two-thirds. In any case, this flow of money is a formidable economic force. The World Bank estimates that the remitt remittance flow is some three times the size of all official foreign aid in the world. Every year, people like Karen send home some close to $600 billion. So this goes on everywhere. A couple of kilometers from Karen's house, you have nine-year-old JJ. Every evening, after finishing his homework, he sits down in front of the computer to talk to his father, who works as an electrician, also in the United Arab Emirates. Parenting by Skype has become a common experience for these people. Every single evening, all around the Philippines, millions of wives, husbands, children, and grandparents sit down in front of the computer in order to catch a glimpse of their loved ones that, that are working abroad. So why all these absences? Why all these goodbyes? Well, it's basically this. It's the idea of moving from this slum in Manila and onto the vision you see on that advertising poster. The idea of owning your own little house, or buying a plot of land, or buying some animals for the family farm. I wanted to do a story about these people and go to the places that rely the most on the labor of these workers who are working for the future. And that's the, um, that's the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait. National Geographic let me travel around for a couple of years and report back what I saw. In Manila, there are whole streets that are lined wall to wall with recruitment agencies that provide to the Gulf countries the one resource they need more than the oil they pump up, human labor. There are schools in Manila where hundreds of women at any given time are training to become housemaids for export, learning how to set tables, make beds, change diapers, dress children. Now, of course, a lot of these women already have their own children at home. That's the economic reason why they're leaving the Philippines in the first place. At the end of this training course, they record interviews where the young ladies pitch their personalities and work skills at the foreign employers. Good day, sir, madam. Good day to you, sir, madam. Good day to you, sir, madam. My duties and responsibilities include mopping the floor, cooking, dishwashing, cleaning the house, ironing your clothes, washing your clothes, and taking care of your children. Can you tell us the proper way of taking care of your children? If the child has an accident, I have to tell my employer immediately and I have to let them know what happened. I'm play with them and take good care of them. And love them like your own children. The good characteristic of a domestic helper. Patient, honest, and trustworthy. That's very person. So what if you make mistake your employer? What will you do? Sir, madam, I have to say sorry. I promise not to do it again. To my future employer, please do hire me because I need this job. For the future of my family and especially for my children. I think I have the qualities and the skills to 
be able to do my work. I promise you that I will do my best. I'll keep busy to my work and um, stay focused. And I promise to finish my two years contract. Two years contract. Two years contract. When they arrive in the Gulf, they're processed through uh, hyper-efficient machinery. Locals can come into marketplaces, browse the catalogs, choose the housemaid of their liking, and go home with them that same afternoon. And so, our friend, the remittance worker, has arrived in the Gulf. Here we are. The oil nations of the Gulf. No place relies as heavily on the remittance workers as they do there. And we're not only talking about housemaids, we're talking about every conceivable type of labor imaginable lives and works here. Like these Pakistanis cleaning the streets in front of the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest tower in Dubai. Dubai municipalities own statistics say that some 96% of all economically active residents are foreign workers. Nine out of ten people living in Qatar are foreign workers. And so it goes for all the surrounding nations, just with some varying percentages. It's a united nations of guest workers from a wide range of different cultures, from the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the other Arab nations like Egypt, Syria, lots of Palestinians, lots of Sub-Saharan Africans, Eastern Europeans, and everywhere else in the world. They're all there for the same reason, to earn money, save money, and send money home. The veneer of the region is one of record-breaking luxury. The tallest and biggest of just about everything, an opulent tourist destination in the Middle East. Now, this facade would be completely impossible without the foreign remittance workers that service the attractions. Like Alex here, from Ghana. He works as the pool ambassador at the Ritz-Carlton Five Star Hotel, serving fruit cocktails to swimming tourists. Many Nepalis, perhaps used to cold mountain air, staff Ski Dubai, the famous indoor ski resort that's open year-round. The local native inhabitants and the guest workers live lives that are very much apart, and that really overlap. Dubai is the kind of place where even the municipal police force have their own luxury car squad. Here its commander is waiting for deployment in the evening while two Bangladeshi maintenance workers is finishing polishing his Lamborghini. Child care is primarily the domain of uh, Malaysian, Indonesian and Filipino young women. Nepal is washing camels at the racetrack. Now, while manual laborers constitute the really large numbers, foreigners also staff managerial and business positions throughout the region, in a, all part of a tightly regulated and hierarchical system. The countries of the region are, are known for their epic-sized construction projects, the most expensive theme parks, the biggest malls, artificial islands shaped like palm trees, or like this new improved version of Venice, a residential area being built on the outskirts of Doha, Qatar. Now, nearly all this work is done by foreign workers, in conditions that you could safely call challenging when the temperatures rise to some plus 50 degrees. Now, just as the natives and the guest workers live lives very much apart. So it is also for the tourists and the guest workers. Servicing the cheap and affordable luxury that attract the tourists, they still view the tourists at a distance. I myself, just after this picture was taken, witnessed a group of guest workers who stepped onto the sand of Jumeirah Beach in Dubai here. Within one minute, a plainclothes policeman stepped up to them to check their ID cards and arrested one of them. It is apparently not desirable for these groups to, to mix too much. When you're there on a holiday, you actually don't notice the guest workers all that much, beyond the tasks they perform. But if some 90% of the population are foreign workers, why, why don't you notice them more? Why aren't they more visible? 
Well, it's because they live elsewhere, in labor camps towards the periphery of the city, towards the desert. Like these South Asian construction workers, having finished their shift building skyscrapers, are waiting for the company bus to take them back home. Tired and hot, after a 12-hour shift, they've started their work day at around 5 a.m., and then are bussed back to the camp at sunset. Depending on the companies that run them and the budgets allocated, the labor camps range from the fairly decent to the downright awful. Most are variations on the concrete box with communal living arrangements and dormitory sleeping. Five people to a room, ten people to a room. I visited uh, one group who were sleeping 18 people to one room in three levels of bunk beds like this. The stories I heard from these workers were one of crushing sameness. It's identical stories being played out again and again and again. A young man wants to provide for his family in a village in, say, Bangladesh. He leaves his wife and children behind, taking up a loan from a local loan shark in order to pay some three, four, or five thousand dollars to a middleman to secure his employment and take it to the Gulf. The calculation is that he'll go for two or three years, earn some real money, and help lift his family out of poverty. But this calculation just so often turns out to be way too optimistic. The kafala system, or the sponsorship system as it's known there, means that the first thing that happens when he arrives is that his passport is taken away from him and given into the custody of his employer. Similarly, his work visa is tied to his employment, meaning that from the get-go, he's at his employer's mercy. Now, organizing or complaining is now highly dangerous, because if he gets himself fired, his work visa will be cancelled, he'll be sent back to his home country and into the hands of the loan shark, where he borrowed the money with debts unpaid. That's not a good idea. The workers often find that their overhead in the Gulf is higher than they expected. They are more expensive. As it turns out, maybe they have to work some five years just to clear their or original debt. So they're caught in this debt circle, and the two-year plan turns into a five-year plan, turns into a ten-year plan. I met people who had been there for 15 years and still struggling to break even. I'm in Dubai, I see income for the day, I see. And Dubai, I see obviously in Korea, I see. And it's a part of it. My wife is with us, over and over with us. I got there in it. I'm going to go to the next one. 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 These workers tend to end up as strangers in their own lives. The years pass by at home. The kids grow up without them. The lucky ones get one vacation to go home every two years. I met this one guy. He, um, he showed me a picture of a newborn and said his wife had just given birth to a son. So I said, congratulations, how wonderful, and we started talking. And I asked him, uh, so when did you go home visit last? <clears throat> and his eyes started tearing up and looked at me and said, well, three years ago. And knowing exactly what was going through my mind, he sought to assure me, he said, well, I, I talked to one of the older workers who said it is physically possible for her to be pregnant that long. <laughs> they come to save their families, and a lot of families are broken in the process. The other guys in the labor camp often become the real working family of these men. Riddled with bad conscience for their absence, a lot of the workers end up buying gadgets, tablets, iPhones, to send home to their children in order to make some sort of mark on their daily life. Relatives and neighbors from the village come asking to borrow some, some money from these rich, successful guys working in fancy Dubai. And so the money starts dissipating, and at the same time, their stay in the Gulf gets longer and longer. 
Doha, Abu Dhabi and Dubai are embroiled in a fight for luxury supremacy. Qatar is gearing up for the Football World Cup of 2022, building air-conditioned stadiums, while Abu Dhabi is putting their money on culture, having local branches of Le Louvre and the Guggenheim Museum built. But it all seems like a different planet than the daily grind of the workers building it all. It's, of course, a complete impossibility for any of these people to gain permanent residency or citizenship. That's strictly forbidden. In the Emirates, a local man who decides to marry an Emirati woman instead of a foreigner automatically gets a $20,000 bonus from the government. The workers have generally one day off a week. Usually it's on Fridays, and you see them around town in whatever open spaces you can find, playing cricket and such things. In Dubai, with all the migrant workers there, men outnumber women some six to one. And the city is a regional hub of sex trafficking and prostitution, catering to every social level, from low-budget, high-volume brothels, catering to the guest workers, as well as higher up the food chain. Now, what do we call all of this? Is this like many human rights organizations call it, what modern slavery looks like today in our globalized world? Are these workers actually indentured servants or serfs? Or is this voluntary work migration a way to short-circuit a crushing cycle of poverty in the village in India? I'll be honest, I found it very difficult at times to know what was what. And I'm not convinced all of the workers I met either knew which one of these realities they themselves inhabited. But this work opened my eyes to the remittance worker everywhere. Not just if one is considering booking a luxury holiday in Dubai or Qatar, but they are everywhere. Maybe after this TED event, you will meet a remittance worker at the restaurant next door. Maybe some of you have nannies or au pairs from the Philippines. Or think of the millions of Mexicans and Latin Americans working in the United States sending money home every month. My wish is that these people become more visible, that we see them, that we engage with them and respect them, and that all of their work and all of those Skype calls are somehow, in the end of the day, worth it. Thank you.